I'm here to talk about how to get a meeting with anyone. And what that really means is turning strangers into your biggest advocates or champions. Growing up with two older brothers, uh, we got into a lot of fights. And that's pretty normal, right? Like that's, you'd expect uh, a bunch of boys in a family in the Midwest to get in fights. But what's not normal is when that's your brother. <laughs> and somehow, and we don't know, like there's kind of theories in the family, but somehow that guy is genetically related to me. And we have no idea. The going theory in the family is like the food just didn't make it down the table. To add insult to injury, my middle brother uh, played defensive end and then offensive line for Illinois State football. I ran cross country, as you can see. But the reason I show this slide is uh, for two reasons. And the first one is, if you don't like my talk, I'm gonna get my bigger brother to come beat you up. And the second reason is, when you have a brother like this, or I should say brothers, you learn an important lesson again and again and again. And that is, and as cliche as this is, no matter how many times you get knocked down, you pick yourself up. Having brothers like these, you get punched often. But it's not necessarily about, okay, I lost this battle and that battle and that battle, but it's about winning the war. So what I wanna talk about today is no matter how many times you hear no or how many times you get rejected from a job offer or how many times someone doesn't respond to your email, how do you actually get that meeting with the person that you believe is gonna help advance your dreams? So we're gonna fast forward a little bit. This is me making soap in 2010. And I know what you're thinking. If you've ever seen uh, the hit show Breaking Bad, you're like, yeah, soap. Sure, and or if any of you guys have ever seen Fight Club, you're probably just like, you're violating the first two rules, bro. Like, what are you doing? But really, I actually started making soap in 2010, and the reason is, is because I worked for the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. And what that really means is that I was doing work around the world uh, on behalf of the US government. I was actually based in DC and I was working for a subcontractor. It was an internship and then led to a more full-time position. Um, but while working there, I kept on reading statistics and looking over the WASH projects or water sanitation and hygiene projects that we were doing around the world. And something as simple as a bar of soap and clean water can save so many lives. It's the most cost-effective and effective public health campaign that can be done. Literally, something as simple as a bar of soap can cut the percentage of people who get infected with diarrhea by half, by half, and acute respiratory diseases by a third. So it really got me thinking, if something as simple as a bar of soap can do this much good, then let's start a non-for-profit that focuses on increasing the efficacy and awareness about hand washing. And as we went down that, that path, I started going, wait, if we want to create a company that talks, walks, and sells like a company, why not just be a company? So we started with the humblest beginnings. And in 2010 and 2011, basically making soap in my kitchen with my co-founders, and it was only until 2012, after begging, pleading, calling, emailing, hounding, harassing, showing up at their offices unannounced, I kid you not, like I literally, this was our first major retailer that we got into in 2012, and I would just camp outside their offices I would just like, they would come in in the morning and I'd be like, hey, I'm still here. And they would leave in the evening and I'd be like, still here, still just sitting here. And eventually after they were like, security, they were like, okay, this soap salesman is not going away. We're just gonna let him have one store. And thankfully one store went so well that we expanded to eight stores and eight stores went to a whole region and we've grown a lot since then. But we still have a long way to go and we definitely have had a lot of bruises and punches, figuratively. Thankfully, the CPG world isn't that violent along the way. So what does this mean, and why do we do this? Well, as I said earlier, every time someone buys one of our products, there's a mission related to it. So every time someone buys one of our bar soaps, liquid hand soaps, body washes, we donate a bar soap, either domestically in local homeless shelters and food pantries, or around the world, 
uh, through a sustainable way of giving. So instead of us actually donating abroad, we work with local makers as to not impact the local economy, as well as not teach dependency. Every time someone buys one of our shampoos, conditioners, or lotions, we actually do a month of clean water development through our amazing partnership with Splash. So one thing that I'm really excited to share with you guys is that on the back of each one of our products is something called the Hope Code. And we were one of the first companies to actually bring this to market. And what this allows a consumer to do is if you buy this at Target, or you buy this at Hy-Vee, or you buy this at Walmart, you're able to take this code onto our website, type it in, and see exactly where the one for one went. Where did this bar of soap or month of water go? So that we can provide the transparency to you guys, but more importantly, so that we can step out of the way and allow a consumer to know their neighbor that they're helping that they never would have known otherwise. So how did this all start? How did a group of 20-something-year-olds get into some of the biggest retailers in the whole country, the whole world? How do we land those meetings and get past all of the red tape and the gatekeepers? Like how did someone who had no experience in CPG build a company that's now on the shelves all across the country? Well, one word, strangers. Now, as you guys were probably taught as kids uh, by your parents, I'm going to try to unteach all of that, not to talk to strangers. More importantly, and I think like some parents in the room are like, oh my gosh, my kids shouldn't hear this earmuffs, is not only how to talk to strangers, but how to get strangers to like you and how to get strangers to become champions of your brand, of you. So everyone's a salesman, not this type of guy, and hopefully not this type of guy, but everyone has to be a salesman because you are your own brand. The age of I'm going to go and work for an employer for the rest of my life like both of my parents did is gone. It's not a reality in today's economy. Whether you're here or in India or in China or Uganda, you have to be your own entrepreneur. And that is whether you're running a not-for-profit or a for-profit or working for the government, you have to be an advocate for your own brand. So what that really means is how are you reaching out and building those connections with strangers and turning those strangers into mentors and then eventually champions so that they're out there speaking your good story and trying to get you to move up the corporate ladder or get you more investment, or get your product, or your venture, or your non-for-profit more funding. So let's just go over some quick statistics about resumes. Obviously, since we're out of college, there are a lot of people in the audience, as well as watching at home, that are going to have to apply to get a job. Well, the problem with applying for jobs these days is that there's such an influx on every HR manager department's desk. Google gets 75,000 resumes a week a week, and everyone in here is just one candidate looking for one position. So when we look at resumes, I don't know if they're effective anymore. Because as an employer myself, I'm looking for someone who can actually vouch for someone's character. So I wanna go into how do you do it? How do you make connections with strangers? How do you land that first meeting? How do you get that first interview? And this is something that I've discovered while building Soapbox, especially when trying to seek for investment. So I wanna talk about the failures that we had. When we first started, either trying to reach out to retailers or investors, I would consistently make this mistake. I would send an encyclopedia of an email. It would be like, hello, my name is David Simnick, blah, 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 blah. Five paragraphs later, eventually I'd be like, please see my business plan, that's 30 pages, and I would like to talk tomorrow. I got no responses, none. And the reason I got no responses is because it was way too much of an ask. Way too big, way too fast. And this sounds really like, yeah, well, duh, like you, you don't do that. But everyone does this. They think that everyone else is so interested in their either venture or career or life or resume or whatever that their ask is way too big, way too fast. And these people on the receiving end don't know you. They just don't. And therefore, you're coming on too strong, and they're like, whoa, so bam, back up. So I usually like to make this analogy. If your neighbor came over and asked you for a teaspoon of sugar, you'd say, yeah, sure. If your neighbor came over and asked for a teaspoon 
within teaspoons and a whole semi-truck of sugar, you would laugh at them. It's the same thing. So I found out this thing called the small ask. And the small ask basically is, let's see if I can do this. Haha, -ha, soap skills. If this falls over, it'll be really funny. So the small ask is pretty simple. It is, if you want to talk to someone and you want to reach out to a mentor, the first email that you should be sending them or note or if you try to get someone to refer you to that person, you start out with one simple question. Maybe two sentences. That's it. When you were doing this, how did you do that? The hook here is that it's really small. It's like a 30 second answer. I get inbounds all the time from student entrepreneurs or people who want to start a social mission company and we still have a long way to go and I also am still seeking advice and mentorship and all that type of stuff but I still, like it's humbling to get these inbounds. When people send me encyclopedias, I go, hey, I, I, I don't have the time, I can't do this. But when someone sends me an answer that I can just type away a response in 30 seconds, I'm more than happy to do it. So the first step is, how do you get someone on 30 seconds? How do you get someone to basically say, okay, yeah, yeah, when, when you launched at Target, what was the most effective temporary price reduction that you guys did? Great, totally, boom. The next step is you come back in a week or two weeks and you do what the person advised you to do. And you say, hey, Dave, I went out, I did this, we put this in the plan, I have another question. I feel a little bit invested in this person who just emailed me because they followed my advice. I feel as if a little bit of their success is my success. And now I'm like, all right, yeah, I kind of want to help because there's, whether it be guilt on my part of making sure that my advice doesn't fail for them or whether the fact that I want to see them succeed because a little bit of me is now shaping their future. So the next thing is, it's about five minutes. Hey, Dave, can you take a five minute call? I promise it'll be quick. Everyone's got five minutes. Literally, a five minute call is super simple. It's all about, hey, I have this problem, I'm working through this, help me, great, totally. And then you wait two weeks or three weeks. And then you come back and say, hey, we're still dealing with this, we followed your advice, we're implementing, it's fantastic. Can we have lunch? Can we have coffee? I'm invested. And it keeps on going, and it keeps on going, and it keeps on going. Until eventually, what happens is me as a fellow entrepreneur, I am opening doors and I am making introductions without them even asking because I feel like their success is a little bit responsible for me. I feel responsible for their success. More importantly, I feel invested in their success. And for all the college students out there, or you know, you're in your career and you're midway through it, and or you wanna start a new, uh, turn a new page because hey, you've, you're, you're about to move into retirement and you wanna figure out how to do that. For anyone in this room who wants to connect to someone who is far away, this, through the small ask, is how you can plant the seed and it can turn into a giant oak of friendship, mentorship, and most importantly, someone who's championing you and your brand. One of the sayings that people always say when you're trying to seek investment as an early entrepreneur is that investors are investing in you, not your idea. Now this seems kind of contradictory, right? Because we probably all watch Shark Tank out there and you're just like, oh no, it's totally the idea. No, 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 angel investors are totally betting on the jockey. And the reason they're betting on the jockey is because you're probably gonna pivot and change the business plan. But they really, really, really wanna invest in you. Can you survive? Can you bring that business to fruition? So when we talk about the small ask, the small ask, in my opinion, can be used for either you're, you're going out to try to get a new job, you're trying to land a new meeting, or you're trying to seek investment or get a donation. It's about building friendships and connections and people who want to support you and your dreams.
So I want to tell you a quick story. One of my friends is a hedge uh, fund manager in Chicago, and this underqualified candidate applied for a role, and there was no way that this, this person's resume was going to get them in the door. So after submitting the resume, he actually sent a um, size 20 size shoe in a shoe box to the firm directed to my friend. And it said, there was a little note in there that said, I'm just trying to get my foot in the door. <laughs> it worked. Small little ask, right? Hey, I just, I just want to have a talk with you. I just want to have you know, an interview. Give me a chance. Unfortunately, the sad thing is he didn't get the job. But what's really interesting is that he came back, that, that friend of mine actually helped that person land a new job because that small little interview built a connection and that person continued to stay in touch with my friend. Those are the type of things that you do. You build friendships with people who seem out of your reach through starting really small and they get invested in you over time. Look, for the students in the audience, for the people who are looking to achieve their dreams, the small ask can be an incredibly useful tool in building connections with people who seem right now way far out of your reach. And people who are going to try to cancel meetings or shut you down or not respond to emails, the problem might not be the fact that they are so far out of reach, the problem might be in your approach. So I ask you, start small. Start with a small ask. Thank you.